And joining us now on the debate in Vancouver, British Columbia, Niels Veldhaus, VP of Research and Director of Fiscal Studies at the Fraser Institute. And here in studio, Matthew Mendelson, founding director of the new think tank, the Mowat Center. And Adam Radwanski, Queen's Park columnist at the Globe and Mail. And a reminder, this is a Your Agenda Thursday broadcast. That means you can reach us via Twitter at twitter.com slash the agenda or send us an email at the agenda at tvo.org. And from time to time, we're going to put your comments up on the screen. And our fifth column blogger, Mike Miner, is hosting a live chat on our Inside Agenda blog. That's on our homepage, tvo.org slash the agenda. So please jump in and join the debate. And it's good to have you two back in studio. Niels, thanks for being there on the line from BC. I want to just start tonight's program by doing a bit of a, um, well, I don't want to be too facetious here, but let's just call it a hit parade. Here are some recent political scandals in Canada that seem to have captured the public's imagination. Michael, if you would, please. 2004, it was revealed the liberal advertising firms received millions of dollars from the sponsorship program meant to promote Canada in Quebec. Two ad men and one civil servant went to jail. 2009, the Auditor General of Ontario found that a billion dollars was wasted by eHealth Ontario in an attempt to put patient records in electronic form. In February, we learned Nova Scotia MLAs claimed inappropriate expenses, such as flat screen TVs and an espresso machine. Earlier this month, Ontario's Auditor General found the Ontario Lottery and Gaming Commission spent money on team building activities at spas, arcades, and paintball fields. And finally, thanks to Adam Radwanski, during the reappointment process for Ontario Ombudsman André Marin, it emerged that he, Marin, had expensed personal hygiene products for his Toronto apartment and a flat screen TV for his Ottawa home. Let's get some reaction. Niels, you first. When you chew over this list, what do you think? Well, it's no surprise. Look, if you look at Auditor General's reports so over the last 15 years uh, at the federal level and, and certainly for all the provinces, it doesn't matter who's in power. It doesn't matter what department uh, we're talking about. There are these types of failures all over the place in government. It has to do with the way government operates. It has to do with the constraints within the public sector. And in fact, if you look over the 15 years, it, it totals the government failure, the total government failure over those 15 years from about uh, 1992 to 2007, $125 billion. You've mentioned a few, but it's much, much, much bigger than that. Okay. Adam, when you see the list, what do you think? Uh, well, I think it, w what confuses me a bit is that I don't know if we've established a clear standard yet for these things. And I think that's probably what's most important for the people who are in government. Uh, I don't think most people, although there's exceptions, I don't think most people are in there looking to uh, get rich quick. And a lot of these things we've talked about are actually fairly minor. Uh, having covered the Andre Moran thing recently, uh, what confused me about that was that it was the same kind of stuff that we've seen some other uh, public servants, uh, e-health would be a good example for that in Ontario. Uh, there was bigger stuff there too, but the personal expenditures and so on was the kind of thing that other people have, have gotten nailed for. Uh, we published it and then somehow it wound up, uh, in his case, it seemed to be okay. Now, I'm not necessarily saying he should have lost his job, but I think if you're in the public service, you look at that and say, okay, so what am I allowed to do and not allowed to do? And it's really important, I think, that, that there's a very clear set of guidelines because most people don't want to see their names in print. They're not looking to get rich quick. Uh, it, it is interesting, Matthew, how, how uh, of course, there was public outrage when we learned that a billion dollars may have been misspent at eHealth and they put all that money into building electronic records and they have nothing to show for it. But it seemed to me there was just as much fury over the $3 date square that somebody tried to, you know, some consultant tried to expense. Um, when you hear, you know, a billion versus three dollars, what goes through your head? Well, I think Adam is right on the question of standards. I'd also say that uh, it's important to understand what we're talking about. Mm. Um, so there are going to be people who uh, uh, have some expenses that may not be justifiable, whether it's a $3 date square or $20 here or there. Some people may care about that. I think most people would say we probably have more important things to worry about. Um, so what we do have is uh, hyper accountability right now. I mean, what I see when you read that list is the fact that we do have very strong lights being shown on a whole range of government activities from the ombuds people to the auditors general to the media to the opposition there are a whole range of lights being shown so when you go back to 1994 to uh, hit the gomri scandal i mean my reaction is that you know it's not surprising that sometimes uh, mistakes are made and i think we have to distinguish between you know people expensing things that may not be justifiable or governments genuinely trying to do their best um, and not succeeding, we which will sometimes happens. Yeah, we will pursue that notion. But first, as long as we're on Gomery, Niels, I know there, there is blood in the water against politicians these days, but is it worth remembering that, in fact, despite the stink of the Gomery situation, the Quebec sponsorship, 
issue. No politicians actually went to jail. It was a civil servant and two admin that went to jail. Is that worth remembering? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, absolutely. Look, this is the problem in the public sector. There, there's very little accountability. And what I mean by accountability, I don't mean your name in the media or, or the media talking about one particular event. I mean losing your job. I mean, if this kind of stuff happens in the private sector, heads roll. People lose their job. If there's criminal activity, if there's theft, like there was in the, in the sponsorship scandal, it was a theft of taxpayer money, people actually go to jail. And the, the problem with the public sector is that there, there is no bottom line responsibility. People don't lose their jobs. Uh, people certainly aren't penalized. And, and that's, I think, why you see a lot of these government failures over and over and over again. It's not just misspent uh, taxpayer funds. It's actually government failure where they say they're going to do something and they just don't do it. And that happens over and over and over again. Let me get a response from Matthew because you used to work in the public service. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I don't think that's true. I think that the accountability um, is much stronger in the public sector. I think that people's expenses and their uh, obligation to, for ministers to stand in front of uh, the opposition and answer questions, to answer questions from uh, journalists, uh, to subject their expenses and all of their spending to the Auditor General. I mean, ministers federally now, every nickel they spend is posted uh, online. And it's very easy to see how public money is spent. And so uh, I think it's an easy thing to say that there's more accountability or in the private sector, but I don't see that. What I see is something uh, different and more nefarious and something that I think is troubling for the public sector, and that is that in the private sector or the nonprofit sector, if you're an organization, you try and do something daring or bold or experiment, you, know, you have a venture capital fund, some things don't work out, um, and your shareholders and your board understand that everything you try and do will not succeed. And thought. I think the public sector is, is right now too cautious. I want to explore that more going in, but you, you work for a private company, I right? Do. The Globe and Mail's private company. I do. But you spend most of your time, you know, keeping an eye on the public sector, mm -hmm. government. So you may have some sense of comparing of the two. He says there's more accountability in the public sector than in the private sector. What do you think? Right now, I can say the people in the private, in the public sector, at least in Ontario, I can't speak for elsewhere, uh, they are a little bit afraid of their own shadows right now. There's no question that, uh, you know, and if I, if I take somebody out for lunch for my job and it's part of doing my job, um, you know, I'm not going to go out for the fanciest meal in town, but I can take them out and talk to them or take them out for a coffee or whatever. I'm reasonably comfortable what I'm doing there. People get nervous whenever the bill turns up uh, when, when they're in, in the public sector. And I understand why that is. And that's politicians and that's also bureaucrats. Uh, I think generally with the public service, there's a pendulum that it swings one way and the other. And I think if you go back a couple of years in Ontario, at least, uh, it had maybe swung a little bit away from accountability. And I think if you look at the e-health example on that, there was sort of a just get this done kind of mentality. Mm -hmm. I think now it may be swung the other way, and what I'm hearing is that people are, are very nervous about how they do their jobs because they don't want to see their name in the spotlight, and maybe the easiest thing is don't do anything. Let, again, we are going to come back to that because that's a, that's a great point, but um, I, I want to find out what's okay and what's not. Niels, let me go through a bit of a checklist with you here, okay? And just sure. short answers as we go through the checklist. Adam Radwanski wants to do his job. To that end, he wants to take some minister of something out for lunch. Who, who's, ob who's obliged to pick up the check? Well, certainly not the taxpayer. Look, if, if Adam needs to take someone out because he needs to sell newspapers, let him pay the bill. Okay, so uh, the, the lunch is on Adam. Uh, is he allowed to take the person to a really nice restaurant? Well, look, that's up for the business to decide. The Globe and Mail has to sell papers. They, they, they have to be profitable. So they, they have every incentive to watch closely what Adam's doing. Okay, let's There's flip it around There's not that incentive in the public let sector. Me, let me flip it around then, Niels. Let's say, um, okay, let's say there's a civil servant who wants to take somebody out for lunch because they're trying to attract that person perhaps to doing some investing in Ontario. So they take that person out to lunch to a nice restaurant and the person orders alcohol. Is that all right? Look, the, the government and the Treasury Board have very strict guidelines. Those guidelines have to be followed. As long as those guidelines are followed, then th they should proceed. Th this isn't about a $50 check or a $100 check. Th this is about big time government failure. And, and it's not these little checks that we're worried about. It's that governments are promising to do things and then they waste money and don't actually do them. I think we have to get at the real root of the problem here. And that is governments promising to do things they're not capable of doing. Matthew, I wonder, when you were, you were a deputy minister at one point, yeah. right? So when you were, uh, presumably you were in that situation that I just described. You had to take somebody out for lunch as a part of your job to do business. Were there incredibly strict rules in place that told you, yes, I'm allowed to take you here, but not here. Yes, you can order this, but you can't order this, or how'd uh, that go? There, there are guidelines um, and uh, I think people are generally uh, cautious. I mean, there aren't lots of examples 
um, in the last five years in Ontario or the federal government um, of ministers or deputy ministers or assistant deputy ministers um, spending $600 on alcohol at lunch. I mean, the things that we're talking about are often independent organizations, so the OLG, eHealth, which had been spun off. Um, and secondly, as, as Niels is talking about, structural issues. Uh, is this money being well spent? And I would you know, disagree with Niels when he says that uh, you know, the, the private sector um, uh, is uh, is more concerned about you know whether Adam is taking uh, is spending money wisely than the public sector is. The public se sector right now, on, in terms of how it's spending, is hyper careful, uh, hyper reporting. There are so many different organizations and lights being shown on how governments spend money that yeah, you're going to find some mistakes, of course. But across a seventy billion dollar budget, um, you don't find that many. Let's find out, Adam, whether the cure is worse than the disease right now, because the reaction to more accountability, more transparency has been, you know, if you're a manager somewhere in government, you want to buy some paper clips, you've got to get six auditors to sign off on it. Do you think, um, do you think this is the appropriate response? Well, you know, I'm not that concerned. I mean, Niels mentioned that, that he's not so worried about the smaller stuff, it's the bigger stuff. And I'm inclined to actually agree with that, but maybe from a slightly different perspective. I think it, these scandals, I mean, if you look at eHealth, is probably the best example in Ontario. There were basically two different issues there. I mean, you had this big public fear over people buying Choco Bites and all that stuff which really was very marginal. Then there was much bigger issues of how contracts were, were awarded. But the first uh, one was all about first optics. One, the first one's what opposition parties care about, it's what people care about, because it's money people can relate to. Mm -hmm. And that's where a lot of that, sort of the, 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 the public scrutiny is. The bigger contracts are more important, and they certainly should be watched more carefully. But it's there where I'm a little more concerned about where we're headed. I mean, whether people go out for lunch or not, or so on, I mean, at the end of the day, it's not gonna have that big a bearing on their job. What worries me a bit is that if it takes you 12 months to get a contract out the door, because you're going through every possible uh, hoop to make sure that, uh, that, that you're not gonna get in any trouble publicly. That really bogs things down. I hear that a lot right now, especially out of the health ministry where, they've, where, they've, where they had a lot of scandal. Now who wants to wind up in that situation again? Well, let me read something that your paper reported last September. And Niels, I'll get you to comment on this first after I read this quote. Uh, here's the Globe from last September. Premier Dalton McGuinty has come to the realization after six years in office that he needs to put Ontario's largest agencies on a shorter leash and has given the province's integrity commissioner new oversight on the travel and entertainment spending of employees at these entities. Len Brooks, a business ethics professor with the University of Toronto's Rotman School of Business, said more oversight is a good idea, but placing too much red tape around expense filings could become a bureaucratic nightmare. Is Len Brooks right in your, in your view, Nils? Uh, yeah, you certainly want to have regulations in place, but uh, obviously it can become overburdensome. Uh, but again, I think we have to look at the bigger problem and, and, and you start looking at some of these programs. I, I would highlight one that we're still talking about, the gun registry. Here's a program, government said it was going to be about $117 million, ended up being multi-billions of dollars, doesn't work, the RCMP says it basically useless in helping them catch criminals and we're still talking about this as a good idea and cer as certainly some politicians are, are, are saying that. We, we have to look more critically at these big programs can governments actually deliver these things? Manage databases. They certainly can't manage databases. E-health is a good example. Our social security numbers, which are absolutely critical uh, to government services, is an absolute mess. Uh, the government has shown that it can't do these things, and that's what we really have to look at. Can they do the big ticket things? Well, not to get too off track here, but one of the reasons we're still talking about the gun registry is because it's still controversial. The police like it. You say the RCMP don't. Uh, the conservatives like it. The police like it. Uh, some, most of the Liberal caucus likes it, some Liberals don't, some do don't. When you get that kind of disagreement, that's a story. That's why we're still talking about it, no? No, look, this, this is a, a multi-billion, two and a half billion dollar failure. Uh, the, the RCMP has reported that it's basically useless in terms of actually helping them uh, uh, catch criminals. Uh, this thing is a mess that should have been killed a long time ago, yet because this is the government sector, we're still talking about this massive government failure. Okay. I think, I think we're yeah. starting to confuse a lot of different issues here. I mean, the gun registry, some people think it works well and some people don't, and so that's a political issue. Mm -hmm. The gun registry is not a spending scandal. Um, so I think well, yeah, there are lots too. of... It, it could be. Well, it could be that too. It could well, be, well, but look, different look, people have different views on whether it's working. So that's, look, that's look, not when a scandal. You, when, Go ahead, when you say When you say something's going to cost $100 million and you tell that to taxpayers and you end up spending over $2 billion, that's a scandal. I think every Canadian taxpayer, the ones who are paying for this, would call that a scandal. Uh, I think uh, that um, Niels is right that sometimes uh, uh, governments uh, do not 
accurately assess how much things are going to cost. And that's a problem. <laughs> There's no doubt that that's a problem. But that's not the same as uh, calling something a scandal. I'm, I'm, I chuckled in the middle of that answer, not because of anything you said, but because of the tweet that came up on the screen there. Can you actually bring that up again, Michael? And that way I'll, I'll ask it to everybody here. Uh, this was via live chat that Mike Miner is doing. If civil servants are so nervous about how they go about their jobs, how did we wind up with the fake lake? How did we wind up with the fake lake? This is why I'm glad I'm not head. covering federal politics. I don't have to worry <laughs> about that kind of thing. How did we wind up with the <laughs> fake lake, Niels? Well, I, I don't know about that, but there's certainly countless examples. Uh, this happens all the time. You know, the Department of National Defense spends $200 million on a satellite. Once they're finished, it took them 10 years to, to make this thing. So once they're finished, they actually found out the satellite that they're using is actually better equipped to handle what they need. So this thing's sitting in a warehouse. I mean, there are over 350 cases like this uh, right across uh, the years, right across the departments. This is a serious problem. And, and I consider these things, I think most Canadians consider these things uh, outright scandals. Not and, uh, that's the You're not going to get much argument there. I, I agree with you there. However, let's consider this, and I'll follow up on the point that you made earlier. If we are so busy chasing our tails right now out of fear of seeing our names in the newspaper or out of fear of of uh, you know spending money unwisely uh, is it possible that there are some good ideas some risky ideas that may have a big payday down the road that won't be pursued because everybody's too afraid to make a mistake Matthew I mean I, I think uh, there's an irony in uh, the focus on scandal which is that uh, I would imagine that Niels, and he seems to have suggested this, uh, would prefer governments to innovate, to find more creative, cost-effective, efficient ways of delivering services. Um, however, um, the focus, the hyper-focus on accountability, uh, being concerned that uh, you will fail, being concerned that you will try something that doesn't work as well, uh, whereas in the private sector, you try that all the time. Successful companies try that all the time. Successful nonprofits innovate. They go down paths that don't work so well. But in the public sector, the irony is uh, we're very afraid to do that right now. And so we get the same old tired ways of delivering programs and services. So I believe that uh, we need to innovate to find more efficient ways of delivering public services. But I think uh, you know, the hyper-focus on accountability is actually preventing that from happening. Adam, you want to follow up on it that? It strikes me in Ontario, and fair to keep coming back to healthcare, but I think that's probably the best example in Ontario. Uh, right now we've got the 14 local health integration networks around the province. Uh, these things you would think are a prime opportunity for, for government to, or for those networks on behalf of the government to experiment with different ways of delivering health care uh, based on different demographics, based on uh, different regional needs, all those things. There's not a lot of experimentation or differentiation. And I think part of the reason is these things are under huge scrutiny. There's, there's the opposition looking for scandal with them. Uh, frankly, they haven't paid people what they probably need to go work there uh, to get them away from, from running hospitals or anywhere else. Uh, because they don't want that to turn up on the sunshine list and cause them problems. Uh, so that really does discourage. And that's one example, I think, where you, know, you take the steps to do it, but then everybody is really afraid of their own shadow and afraid of actually d differing too much from the norm. Can I give yeah, sure, an, an example? I mean, uh, right now in, uh, with the legacy of eHealth, um, uh, governments across the board, not just Ontario, federal, across the board, are quite afraid to pursue big IT projects. And governments don't have necessarily a great track record of managing big IT projects. There's no doubt about that. Um, but in order to find efficiencies and cost savings in healthcare and education, uh, we're going to have to roll out new uh, information technology. And uh, uh, electronic health records and other uses of technologies are ways of finding more efficient, more cost-effective ways of delivering public services um, uh, in new ways. And if governments are afraid to uh, pursue those paths, I think over the long term we're not going to be well so you think everyone's afraid to be the next e-health, so no one's going to try that. Is that uh, the idea? I, I think that that's uh, well, a reasonable conclusion. Let me conclusion. put that to Niels. Niels, how do you want to balance the need for accountability in government with the need to give the public sector the room to occasionally fail and the room to uh, you know, take some risks in order to do their job better? Look, look, the governments have a long history of trying these things. Uh, as we just mentioned, they have a long history of getting it wrong when it comes to uh, technology. This happens over and over again. They're not afraid to try things. They, they, they do these things all the time, but they fail at doing them. Uh, it, it's a pipe dream to think that we want the government to become more efficient, to be more innovative. If we want a better health care system, uh, whether that's tracking, uh, tracking health ex uh, records or, or whether that's running a hospital, we've got to rely more on the private sector. 
they actually have the incentive to go out and be efficient, to be innovative, uh, to, to focus on customer service. You're, you're just not going to get that in the public sector, uh, and we've seen that over time. Well, hang on. How, how is it not in the interest of the public sector to spend money wisely and to not screw up? Well, again, I mean, look at, uh, look at the, the way the private sector, sorry, the public sector operates. The public sector operates usually in a monopoly environment. That's certainly the case in, the case in healthcare. Uh, that's why you don't get uh, cost efficiencies. Uh, that's why you get uh, more and more money being spent on healthcare without getting more and better results. That doesn't happen in the private sector. In the private sector, businesses are out there to make a profit. And in order to make a profit, customers have to keep coming back. And so if the government needs to do something, Let's contract it out to the private sector. Let's get the private sector to bid on it. And then if the private sector is not doing their job, we can cancel the contract and move on to the next one. I think that's a much better uh, way to go forward than continue, continually to rely on governments which have a track record of failing. But the, the great irony of this conversation is that we're talking about e-health. That basically was an end around to get around the public sector and go to the private sector. Uh, it didn't. It was a sloppy end around. How do you mean? Well, I mean, what they've basically done, uh, the whole IT project had been bogged down in the ministry. Uh, they basically went to uh, people who were, who were working sort of in the ministry, but were basically told, get this done, give contracts, get it to the private sector, get these guys to do their job. That's why there are all these big consulting contracts and so on. Now, it was done sloppily. They weren't very well managed. But the general idea was actually kind of what Niels was talking about. Uh, the problem is that now, because of the way that blew up, uh, they're much less likely to do that next time they need to do something. So, well, they uh, shouldn't have given contracts to their friends. I mean, this is called bidding. It's called tendering contracts, doing it properly. That has to be done right. You shouldn't be giving these contracts to your friend, which was the case actually in eHealth. So you're right. We have to, to make sure that we have competitive bids. That's absolutely essential. But the bottom line here is that the private sector can do it more efficiently and can do it at a lower cost. Uh, Neil seems to be uh, making an ideological point, which he obviously has the right to do, and no. I respect that point. But, uh, I mean, he's wrong about two, two things. One, he says there aren't incentives in the public sector to spend money efficiently. I mean, I think the fact that we're talking about these scandals highlights that uh, governments and public servants and ministers have huge incentives to spend money uh, wisely. They, ministers in particular on the political side, they uh, face questions in the House of Commons, they face journalists, they have huge incentives to be uh, spending money efficiently. And secondly, um, as Adam pointed out, when we talk about organizations like uh, the OLG or E health a lot of these uh, in the quote you read you know we're bringing these independent agencies under uh, under new regulations uh, a lot of the movement uh, towards uh, these uh, independent agencies so pseudo uh, private organizations private contracting a lot of that um, was done to uh, get around the fact that the bureaucracies, the ministries, are quite afraid. But a lot of these scandals are taking place um, with private sector leaders uh, brought in from outside using private sector rules um, and a private sector culture, which has uh, often a much more generous uh, way of spending money. Yeah. Niels. That's totally false. I mean, this is not ideological. This is empirical. Look at the evidence. Look at the Auditor General's reports. If you go back and study them, you see time and time again doesn't matter if it's the Liberals in power, doesn't matter if it's the Conservatives in power, doesn't matter what department it is. These are government failures that happen consistently. And politicians have incentives, absolutely. And bureaucrats have incentives, but they're perverse incentives. They're to actually make the problem worse than they actually are. They're to get bigger budgets and more staff. They're not to be efficient, uh, to, to have great customer service, and to be innovative. Those things don't happen in the public sector. It's not the bureaucrats' fault. It's the structure and the incentives uh, and it's the institution of the public sector. Niels, I'm not sure you've addressed uh, Matthew's point, though, on the incentive of keeping your name out of the newspaper, not being the star of question period because you or your department have screwed up. I mean, is, is yeah, there sure. not great incentive on, on those politicians and those public servants to spend wisely, not to screw up, so they don't become, you know, the eye of the, cir the media circus that inevitably happens? Yeah, absolutely. And when we're talking about minuscule expenses, uh, like going out for dinner, I, I agree with that. You don't want to have your, your name in the paper, and, and that's why most times th that sort of stuff doesn't happen in the public sector. We're talking about bigger, bigger things. For example, uh, uh, all-day uh, kindergarten. Uh, politicians love coming up with these things because they're not the ones that actually have to pay for it. They can introduce them, uh, put a little bit of money in the budget, and then when they're long gone, uh, it's the taxpayer who's left uh, to pay the bill. That's the problem. It's not the little expenses. It's the bigger picture. Let's play some tape here. Uh, just over a month ago, the Ontario Liberal Party held a conference in Collingwood, and one of their keynote speakers was Malcolm Gladwell, New Yorker writer, Canadian, uh, author of many books, Outliers, Blink, Tipping Point, and uh, 
He offered some advice to the government of Ontario, and we're going to play a little snippet of that advice right now. Roll tape, please. So, for example, in the second of those three principles, the idea of that governments uh, should be encouraged to experiment. By definition, some portion of experiments end in failure. And I'm actually very happy with that. And in the private sector, of course, people experiment and fail all the time. And they understand that failures are necessary for successes, that you, there are certain kinds of things that you only learn through trial and error. Um, and in many private sector environments, people are enormously and appropriately forgiving of mistakes or failures or um, in the, we need to, to learn to be as forgiving of those kinds of things in the public sector. Niels, are you in a forgiving mood when it comes to the public sector? <laughs> no, I think he's absolutely wrong. Uh, look, in, in, the, in the private sector, uh, people do experiment and of course they make mistakes, but they're calculated risk. They, they really spend a lot of time worrying about how much risk are you taking versus what the potential return is. That doesn't happen in the private sector, sorry, in the public sector. And in the private sector, CEOs are absolutely on the line. Great example is in WestJet. The, 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 the CEO uh, just left there because of a very poor implementation of, uh, uh, of a rollout of their online, uh, online booking uh, process. I mean, this happens all the time in the private sector. It doesn't happen in the public sector. Ministers don't lose their jobs in the public sector? Well, ministers might get uh, portfolio switches, or if there's a large scandal, they might get booted out of cabinet. But in the, in the bureaucracy, absolutely not. There's very few times you can, and very few cases, where you hear of uh, public sector servants actually uh, getting fired for, uh, for a risk that they take. More forgiving of failure in the public sector. Adam, what do you say? I'm not sure that I believe that entirely. I mean, it's interesting. That I'm not sure I entirely agree with what Malcolm Gladwell said either, that, uh, that the private sector is inherently more creative. I mean, to be honest, one of the, conf one of the, the complaints you hear about the private sector uh, in Ontario in particular is that it's actually been um, extremely conservative and risk averse. Uh, you know, I, I've heard that complaint that governments have given more tax incentives and so on, haven't been fully capitalized on. That's a whole other topic. But uh, I don't th I mean, we're, we're painting an incredible broad strokes here. I mean, I don't think, is the, is the mid-level bureaucrat um, less incentivized to, to take risks and be creative and so on? Maybe, yeah, because there's a certain class, and I think more federally than provincially, but still probably both, uh, where you're kind of in a job, you've got great job security and so on. If we're talking about deputy ministers, assistant deputy ministers, when I mean, these people move around every couple of years to different jobs, uh, the pressure on them is considerable, to put it mildly. Uh, they're accountable to uh, ministers who are worried about their job every second of the day. I don't believe that at the high levels there's no incentive. Whether they're all good is a different question. Uh, but the scrutiny on them internally is, is pretty enormous, actually. Matthew, when you were in the civil service, when you were a deputy minister, did you sense a culture of forgiveness when it came to making mistakes? Sure, go out there, take a few risks, make some mistakes, it's okay. Maybe we'll get greatness at the end of the day. Did you see that there? I, I think it uh, depends. It, uh, from time to time, you would see that. Uh, I think certain politicians are more daring or bold. There's no doubt about that. Um, but I think on the accountability front, we've reached uh, the point of diminishing returns. Uh, I think that uh, the, uh, the accountability and transparency revolution of the last 25 years have been enormously important. Auditor General and Ombudsman have done extraordinarily work and served uh, the people of uh, Canada incredibly. But I think that we're in a situation now where mid-level uh, public servants, where political staffers, where nonprofit organizations are uh, weighed down by accountability structures, they're weighed down by a paper burden that isn't serving a larger purpose. Uh, I think, you know, my grandmother would say we're, uh, we're, we're penny wise and pound foolish that uh, we invest so much time uh, in these accountability structures and filling out forms and documenting that that becomes an enormous amount of people's time. It becomes an enormous amount of people's time in the nonprofit sector in order to get a small grant to deliver a vital public service. And I think that's a problem. Less than three minutes to go. Niels, let me try this with you. Uh, I appreciate where you're coming from. I appreciate the point you're trying to make. I wonder whether you feel a little bit skittish beating the drum for the brilliance of the private sector at this point, when it was, in essence, the taxpayer, the public sector, that had to come in and, um, you know, essentially save the economy, um, save jobs, uh, save the financial system, which nearly went into the toilet because of the incredible greed, avarice, call it what you will, of uh, some folks on Wall Street to begin with? Absolutely false. Look. If you, if you want to understand the root of the financial collapse uh, in the United States, and the United States is different than Canada, but in the United States, it is about home ownership. Uh, it's about getting people to own homes that had no business owning homes. Those were government programs, government relaxed regulations. It's primarily a government failure 
not a market failure. Certainly the private sector had some part in it, but the root of the problem here is the bad policies at the government level. In Canada, we didn't have near as bad a recession. We got out of the recession. The stimulus spending didn't work in Canada. It was the private sector that got us out of recession. Uh, so I, I, don't, uh, I don't buy uh, the premise that it was the private sector uh, that was the cause of the recession and that the government pulled us out of recession. I don't think the data actually shows that. Well, there's certainly plenty of blame to go around. There's no question about that. It wasn't all done on Wall Street. And you're right. Government policy certainly played a role. Freddie, uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac played a role in all that. That is all true. Uh, but is this a tough time to be beating the drum for the brilliance of the private sector? that notwithstanding? No, absolutely not. Look what happened in Canada. Uh, we, we had a recession in Canada. The private sector pulled us out. We have more business investment now. Uh, in fact, all of the data from Stats Canada shows that it was the private sector that's leading the growth. It, it's not the government. It's not stimulus spending. Uh, and in fact, Canada is a great place to be. We have a vibrant private sector. Uh, we're finally getting some of our policies right on, on business taxes and those sorts of things. So uh, I think this is a great time, actually, uh, uh, to be in Canada and to be in the private sector. And and certainly, uh, it is really leading the charge here in terms of our economy and our prosperity. Okay. Adam, let me give you the last 30 seconds here. Where are we historically in terms of, you know, one means we're turning a blind eye to every malfeasance going on. Ten means we're throwing people in jail for, you know, $3 date squares. How are we doing? Right now, we're about an eight. We're uh, about an eight. I, I would have fed, I would say nine or ten if, if, if that Marinster had gone differently when we reported it. <laughs> I'm not saying I wish it had. I'm just saying that. Uh, that maybe gave me a bit of pause there because we seem to be a little more selective about these things. Uh, but I do think that if you were to, to go through the public service, uh, and politicians in particular, uh, they are all probably first and foremost trying to avoid getting in trouble right now. Hmm. Okay, thanks everybody very much for this debate tonight. Niels Veldhaus from the Fraser Institute in Vancouver, BC. It's good of you to join us on the line tonight. Thanks, Niels. Adam Thank Radwanski from the Globe and Mail. Matthew Mendelson from the Mowat Center. Good to have you here in our studios in Toronto.